All right, welcome back to SF Vortex. We've made it down to the war room and joining me today, Joe Senna is here, VP of Creative Affairs at Creation Entertainment and the creator of the Dungeon of Darkness website and Universal's upcoming monster site. Also here is John Beekler, genre film director and makeup and creature effects artist. And he needs no, inter no introduction. He is Warren James, sci-fi radio host of Hour 25 on KPFK Radio in Los Angeles. Los Angeles and our very own rocket scientist. Guys, welcome. Thanks. Thank Topic you. number one. Most memorable and why your most memorable alien, Joe Stardesaw. It uh, depends on what you want to remember the alien for. If you want to go for scary, you, Let's go, right go, to, scary. you go right to the alien from Aliens. Okay. Um, you didn't know what it looked like for the first three quarters of the picture. Um, so, of course, it's like the blind man and the elephant. You're seeing one body part here, one body part there, and you're thinking, oh, my God, this thing must be disgusting. And half of the time you're seeing nothing but ooze. And um, most of the time your mind is putting together something scarier than what right. could possibly be envisioned. Right. If you remember, there was total secrecy about uh, what it looked like. Uh, right up until the day of the premiere. I don't know if I'm dating myself, but I was on the one line the first day with the program book, you know, saying, geez, what does this thing look like? There are no pictures. Oh, God, what is the thing going to, it's going to scare the crap out of me. We yeah, date ourselves sure all the time here. Don't worry about that. John Beekler, you're another alien expert. Do you agree with him? Scariest? Well, alien from Alien? The aspect of Alien that I think was the most scary was probably the chest burster because it's very disturbing, the concept of this thing going down your throat and staying there, right. creating a little lump there, and then finally, <laughs> and then you got to see the little guy. Do that sound effect again. It's very impressive. <laughs> yeah. okay. That's why but, he's the but man. But you, you got to see him, and, and for me, that's always a little bit scarier. I mean, you can hint, like Hitchcock, right. when, when he would scare people, he'd hint at what was coming, but then he'd pay you off with like a, an amazing visual. And I think that's exactly what they did with the chest burster. So I have to say that he's, that little guy, to me, is even more frightening than, than the alien at the end because okay. that's sort of a rubber man in a suit. Well, that scene also right. worked really well because uh, from, what you, from what you hear, the director did not prepare the actors in that scene. Um, so they had John Hurt already on, the, on his back on the table right. and they had this effect all worked up. So they gathered everyone around and all of a sudden his chest blows open. And uh, there's Veronica Cartwright with crap all over her face, literally scared to death. I love it. <laughs> right. Warren James, since when are you so shy? Get in here. What? Your favorite alien ever. Uh, I'm going with Charo. You agree? With <laughs> well, no. Is that a legal think, alien? In, in taking the taking attack that in Alien, the fact that the alien was only occasionally visible and partially visible so that it mainly played in your imagination, I'd say one of the most memorable aliens ever were the Krell. From Forbidden Planet. Ah, uh, 1956. Walter Pigeon, uh, Les uh, young Leslie Nielsen. You got Anne Before Francis. he got into humor. That, that's right. Directed by, let's see, that was Fred McLeod Wilcox, based on a story by Irving Block and Alan Adler. I don't know much about the movie, but go ahead. <laughs> well, you know what story they took it from, don't you? Uh, yes, that would be from Shakespeare's Attemptus. Thanks for Very coming. Very good. Okay, let's go Very to good. Break from our role. <laughs> Very go good. Um, anyway, the thing about the Krell is that they were played off in your imagination, and they end up representing many of our ideas mm -hmm. about what creatures people would be like after thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years of evolution. Right. But on the, on the other, taking another take in terms of aliens that you really see and you get to know, mm -hmm. the Klingons from Star Trek are very well done because over the years they have layered on elements of their history, their culture, and there's certainly been problems and bits of silliness that they've done. But overall they've become some of the best fleshed out aliens in the world. You even have a language for them. Got a great story about the Klingon language. Let's hear it. There is a, an American. Oh, by the way, before, before you tell your story, no. uh, the Forbidden Planet, yeah. the uh, score was by Lewis and B.B. Barron. Just yes. thought I'd throw that in there. Okay, but go ahead. Yes. Tell this great Klingon story. Let's hear it. Okay, American tourist is in Japan. Right. He is looking, you know, he's, he goes off into the country, away from the major cities. He misses his train back to Tokyo. He gets back to the train station, and now it's like, okay, uh, When's my train? Where do I get a train? Well, he's he, lost, basically. He's lost, right. totally lost. He doesn't speak Japanese. No one there speaks English because he's out in the country. He's like he's, a nun in Las Vegas at this point. At that point. <laughs> right. He's standing around on the, on the train station looking around, and a Japanese kid walks by wearing a T-shirt. In Klingon letters, it says, yes, as a matter of fact, I speak Klingon. Oh, boy. Wow. So this American tourist, who also spoke Klingon, 
looks at the kid and they start talking and their only common language is Klingon and he figures out how to get back to Tokyo by talking to this Japanese kid in Klingon. It's the only language they shared in common. Wow, that's unbelievable. That, is, that just goes this to show you terrifying. the power of... That's, that, now, yeah, that's really that is, frightening. It's, it's terrifying. That, that, they both have Klingon phrase books and they're saying, uh, take me to the corner and eat my head. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be real careful with Klingon if right. you say it with the wrong intonation. Totally different meaning. Really but you bring up a very good point. Warren does bring another, another great point here. The Klingons, the Vulcans, the Romulans. Why have these aliens, why are they so special with the fans? What is it about them that makes them so special? Joe? Each of the aliens seems to represent a different part of, I would say, American culture. Um, specifically, the, uh, the way the Klingons were played out later on in Star Trek, as the Klingons were the barbarian race with a sense of honor versus um, the uh, benign imperialists in Starfleet. Mm -hmm. um, the Klingons represented what we are basically now versus the folks in the Federation who are what we're trying to strive to be. Um, so the Klingons, in fact, if you go to any of our Star Trek conventions, um, are, are the largest represented alien right. force um, in the, in the, the fan group. So they John are. Beekler, are they just, they, we're just not intimidated by them because they're a little closer to us? Is that the deal? What are we, where are we going here? I think we're, we, we identify with them because they got bumpy foreheads. I know I certainly do, and right. that, that All through high school, me. I had a bumpy yeah. forehead. You I, too? Yep. Oh, me too. No, I, what, what makes Klingons, I think, different from other things is, is, is like you say, that they are a barbaric race. Right. But they have a sense of honor. They have a sense of honor. Well, so all barbarians, myself included, have a sense of honor. <laughs> but I, I think that, that they're, they're scary looking, which most kids think is cool, mm -hmm. right. and and on the other side, they they go for it. They're they're mm -hmm. not as civilized, and uh, we do relate to them more than the members of the Federation. I mean, we are the Klingons. We're the guys that Basically. go in and take over, and and we have to be held in check. Speak by the for Federation. yourself. I'm a Vulcan, okay? But I do have to go to a break. <laughs> That's illogical. <laughs> Gotta go to a break. There's lots more here in the war room, folks. Don't go anywhere. We're right back with more alien talk. See you then. All right, welcome back to a Vulcan favorite, SF Vortex. I'm your host, I'm Roger Lodge, half Vulcan. Still in the war room with horror webmaster Joe Senna, special effects artist John Beekler, and sci-fi radio host extraordinaire Mr. Warren James. All right, guys, most TV aliens, in my humble opinion, don't come across as scary, don't come across as, as good as, as the film aliens. John Beekler, is it a money thing? What's happening here? I mean, if you're talking about aesthetics, no, I, th I think it, it's, it's a matter of how you approach it. Money doesn't really have that much to do with it. I mean, for, for my own personal taste, right. you compare Star Trek to Babylon 5. I personally prefer the aliens on Babylon 5. Why? Uh, they're, I, I like them aesthetically. They're better. They're more interesting. They're, aliens just aren't creatures with a bunch of bumps on yeah, their they face. They don't look right. face at least. On yeah, right. they, they don't they look don't like a, stop here. And, yeah, you're, and, you you're not, and you're talking about a budgetary difference. You know that it, that is sizable. I mean, the Babylon Five is relatively low budget by comparison. So, in terms of being a, a realistic, well received, very well understood character, I think the. Money doesn't enter into it. It's it's just a, a, a sense of aesthetics. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of times on Star Trek, all of the the secondary aliens, the one the one show aliens, they all end up looking like someone that escaped out of the emergency room. <laughs> yeah. Well, they've so, always yeah. said that they try they try to make them represent a part of the human uh, psyche, a, a particular human trait, without coming right out and having people staring at the at the alien alien makeup for so long saying, wow, what a cool looking alien. I have no idea what the hell he's supposed to say to yeah, us. Yeah, but isn't that, I think that's a problem with aliens on TV is that they're not created as characters. They're created as icons, as symbols. And if you parade someone around who is just a symbol and not a well-rounded character, then you have real problems doing drama. That's, that's only if they're, if, they're, if they're supposed to be recurring characters. It's one thing, Even but usually they bring them on character. for one, epi one particular episode and say, hi, this person represents this particular trait. Then you've got Worf, who's singularly the most, uh, most well-liked Klingon in all of Star Trek history. Someone we are following through his adventure trying to be more than what he is, trying yeah. to become well, the Starfleet type character. Right. Worf is certainly uh, an iconic character. He is the fish out of water. Mm -hmm. I mean, his background is one, he's got one background, but he's forced to live in a different environment. Mm -hmm. So that makes him a fascinating character because hey, we the all love, like that. Is it the mm -hmm. love for all these, the Klingons, the Vulcans, all these aliens? Is that why a show like Voyager at the last second has canceled their season finale and now they're bringing back the Borg? No. Beekler? What's the reason for that? I haven't a clue. They're I, desperate. I, I think I think it's 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 a it's a tough show to follow in the footsteps steps of Next Generation. I think that uh, 
the the movie was the last movie was terrific, and I think that they're trying to renew the franchise somehow, any way yeah. they can. And I think that they've they've got a good plan now. Warren Boy James, oh, is it a desperate ratings it's, move? Wow. It's desperate because they've got a terrible show. And if you want an example of how oh, terrible it is, take a, take, a, take a look at um, one of the aliens they created, the Kazon. Right. They were incredibly schizophrenic. They had them demonstrating vast technology, able to take on Federation starships on the one hand. Really and yet cool too. <laughs> and whenever they showed them on, the, on a planet's surface, I mean, they looked like some kind of escapees from a third world village. <laughs> they, they hadn't thought through the characteristics of the society, the culture, the technology associated with those aliens. What they did was they came up with whatever would, look, would, whatever would work good in a given scene, in a right. given given part of the story. It was incredibly stupid. All right. And they've gone bringing, down from there. The board it, it, back yeah. now. And the Borg are the, the best looking zombies in space since Plan 9 Oh, that Borg space. Queen? I have no problem with that Borg Queen. Yeah, oh, but the Borg Absolutely. Queen is totally inconsistent with everything else they've established about the Borg. If you have a hive entity, you don't have a queen directing it. Right. Okay, Tell enough about the, the Borg. Tell that to the bees. All right, let's move on to my next topic. Okay, they may not be from outer space, Joe Senna, mm -hmm. but Wolfman. You got the creature from uh, the creature, all these television aliens, my ex-mother-in-law. Why don't we see more more monsters in the movies? How'd well, you know? it looks That's like my next it looks like it looks like they're coming back. Anaconda did uh, really great business for the last couple of weeks. The Relic, which didn't get a lot of promotion, did right. pretty decently. Um, Godzilla is coming out next year with a big budget treatment. Can't wait King for that. Kong is right around the corner. The monsters once again represent a particular part of American of, of the collective American conscience at that particular time. Universal specialized in that, mm -hmm. from uh, the silent days of Lon Chaney right through the 1940s. Um, Godzilla represented the uh, nuclear threat. King Kong represented white America's fear of the mixing of the races. Dracula represented the fear of immigration. It was something that was going on in America at that particular time that the monster comes out and says, hi, this is what I'm representing in your subconscious, and I'm going to scare the piss out of you. But there, um, can I say that? You can say that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, but the thing, is, well, think about, the thing about Chris, Dracula, yes. you, you know, what you said about Dracula is one take on it, but there are other takes on, on vampires in general. Uh, David Scow has discussed this at length, talking about how vampires represent a fear of blood diseases. Vampires in Victorian ages were representing fear of venereal diseases. Today, right. they represent fear of AIDS. Right, absolutely. And, 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 that, that. and that really, I think, explains why vampires are so popular today. Well, just to let you folks at home know this, only 15% of the viewers polled like monster movies more than alien movies. So maybe that's why there's not as many monster movies, huh? No, I think the reason why there aren't as many monster movies is because there's not as many horror films. And there's a reason why there's not as many horror films is because if you're going for pre-sales foreign, horror seems to be dead. Uh, but if you call it a thriller or if you call it a monster movie, it's coming back again with, with Anaconda, with uh, the new Godzilla movie, and a bunch of other films that are coming out. So horror movies are dead? Horror movies are, if you call them a horror movie, they're dead. But, it, but if you go to the box office and, and you watch the movies, they're there all the time. They're just labeled something else. I don't know. Yeah. I kind of like showgirls. That's all the time we have for the War Room, folks. I'd like to thank my guest, Joe Sena. John Beekler and Mr. Warren James. Don't touch that dial. There's lots more in the Vortex when we return. See you in a minute.